Hello, hello, and hello, everybody! Welcome back for another episode. If not now, when? In today's show, I am really excited to introducing Steve Schaffer.、Uh, Steve is a serious entrepreneur, advisor, and investors. He started his company back to 2009 and have a quite successful asset 2015. So today he efforts he focuses all his efforts on giving back to startup ecosystem through Capital Factory, TechStars, and many more. As a strategic advisor and early stage investors, see focusing on、uh, supporting companies in emerging digital business, a model that has potential to reach over a hundred millions or more. Through his personal investment, he already have quite a success as it, such as Gift and Meta Sass. With that, my friend, please join me to welcome Steve to the show. So, Steve, tell us how is all the journey began for you? You know, it's always hard to know when something began, right? I mean, as a as a young child, I always liked thinking about what could be.、Uh, my first actual business was when I was ten. What? Yes, my、um, a friend of my mom's bought a, me a magic set, and I learned all the tricks.、Oh. And a friend of mine had one as well, so we decided well we could do birthday parties because I had had a magician at my birthday when I was a little kid. I was ten, mind you. I was thinking back to when I was a little kid. So we did our first birthday party together. How much you charge?、Uh, Two dollars, one dollar each. Nice. Yes, I still have this. A long time ago, so <laughs> I still have the dollar. Nice.、Um, it's framed on my wall, but of course. But anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up in, really enjoying it. I like the what presentation part. What do you enjoy about part, it? Just、yeah. the whole process and thinking through it. And then I went bu- went to the magic store and bought some more magic tricks. And ended up building a business basically as a kid. And I, I originally had a partner, Hocus and Pocus, and then I went out on my own and I became Hocus the Great. And、uh, yeah, it was that was really、uh, aspirational, if you will. Wow! And I did children's birthday parties from when I was ten until after, but right before I left for college was my last party. You are, wow! You are committed. I was committed. I got better. I, I learned how to run an ad and have my ad show up first in the classified section of the local paper. Wow! And you were so ahead of time. Gave away、Steve. business cards with the balloons that I, I made balloons at the end, and did you know hundreds of shows over the course of those those eight years, and it was a great experience. It was fun, but I also started to do very well.、Yeah. Um, by the end, I was making fifty dollars for a one-hour show. That's incredible. Yeah, so it was good. Is your、uh, a favorite lesson you have learned in that eight ten years of running your own small business well, it's, it's, at the it, time? It's interesting because one of them was、um, I got my my customers from two sources. One was by putting a card and giving having the kid take a card home. And hopefully they said, "Hey, mom, this guy did this magic show. We should have him at my birthday party." You never know what the kid says to the mom or the dad.、Um, and then the other one was I ran an ad, and I think my business was about fifty-fifty from the ad and from the. But the ad was cheap. It cost me about twenty bucks a week. So all I needed was you know one show a week from the ad, and I and I and it generally paid for itself. But I kept tweaking the copy in the ad. So that it would sort the first one in the entertainment section. What made you so curious and obsessed about this business? Again, is a is a your own passion at first, right? But later, I imagine you grew beyond just passion. It was、right? just doing doing it better. Yeah.、Um, I think my、uh, my mom had a really interesting way to motivate me, which was she didn't do anything. So if anybody called, they would call and ask for Hocus because this is before cell phones, right? And she would just take a message and write down, you know, Mary and a phone number, and then that was it. She wouldn't know the date, how old the <laughs> kid was. She really let me do it all. Nice. And I don't know that she did that on purpose, but she really instilled in me, you know, you got to figure it out on your own. Did you figure it out? I did. So、yeah. when you go to college, is there a moment thinking, okay, that could be a business to go back to, or absolutely? Your,、uh, so I went. Change? I went to the University of Texas. I brought my magic with me. And I looked. There was no local newspaper. There was just the Austin American Statesman.、Uh-huh. Again, this is pre-internet days, right? I'm aging myself a little bit. And I said, "Well, how do people hire something like a magician?" And I asked someone, and they said, "Well, the Yellow Pages 
for the audience that doesn't know what the yellow pages are, you can maybe do that on another episode. But um, well, the yellow, yellow pages had a one year cycle. Uh-huh. And if I placed an ad for the Yellow Pages, a year later, my phone number would, will have changed. Because when you're in college, you got a new phone number every year whenever you moved, right? Okay. So that was the end of my magic career. That summer, I did some shows back in Chicago where I grew up. Yeah. And that was the end of my uh, professional magic career. <laughs> and is there a moment you thought to yourself, wow, running business is interesting. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, that's what I always wanted to do. Why? I had a... It was just... I don't know. You know, are, are entrepreneurs made or born, right? I think it's yeah. a little of both, but I always liked creating. I liked mm-hmm. figuring things out. Yeah. Um, I remember I used to tell my grandfather I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and he said I should be a lawyer like his brother. Uh-huh. I wouldn't have to work so hard. <laughs> and I thought that was really uh, good advice, but it was also a bit inspiring. It was like, well, I want to work hard, right? Because he worked for an entrepreneur uh-huh. who um, ran a, like a, a lighting manufacturer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he left at five o'clock and the owner was still there. So he, he was trying to discourage me from that lifestyle because, you know, you, you, there was, there's other ways to, to, to make a living. But I was just, it was just always who I was. So after college, what happened from there, Steve? Well, so in college, I started a couple more businesses. I oh, wow. sold roses for, for parties. I sold party favors for parties. You and parties yes. is your middle name. You know, that's, that's funny. I never really thought maybe I should have been a, done, done something in the party world. But um, And then my senior year of, of, of college, we started a store selling products for the Macintosh. And that was a, a success, but had some issues that I won't go into with a partner so moved on to another startup, and then about a year later, ended up in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Tell us. So, do you at the time thinking I'm going to start my own business now in Silicon Valley, or do you part of? How do you? No, in Silicon journey? Valley, I was looking for a. I decided that you know two startups was good, but in t- in tech gave me some experience. It was time to go learn from someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I did a bunch of interviewing at the mm-hmm, time, mm-hmm. and ended up at a a one person company. He had made a software product, mm-hmm. and. He sold it five months later. Oh. And it was a great Silicon Valley example of here That's today, fast. gone tomorrow. Yeah. That somebody just hit his number and he didn't really intend to build a company. He just wanted to make a little bit of money. And when when it, when the offer was like more than he expected, um, looking back, it was quite a um quite a the the, the company got a great deal who bought him. Okay. Right. I mean, they literally. I mean, looking back, if, I, I don't remember all the numbers, but uh, um, but it was a, a you know interesting process for me because I was there in a support role. Mm-hmm. It wasn't my decision. Um, and you're just one person, so you're right there with all the things happening. Yeah, and it was it was it was fun. So from there, I went and got a um, a product manager job um, at Symantec, where I learned a lot, and then ended up at Power Up Software, where I learned some more. And do um, you in your backup you have? Always knew you're going to go back to startup. Oh, no, yeah, I, I, I assumed so. Right, it was just a question of when. Um, for one brief moment, the company that had sold the two-person company, I had thought, well, maybe I can raise the money to buy it. Oh, wow! And I, I just, I didn't have any network. I didn't have any connection. I didn't yeah. have any family money to draw on. So I, I just didn't know at the time how to how to do that, and. Um, yeah, that would have been an interesting, uh, you know, kind of journey because the product was doing really, really well. Wow! Um, and you still remember that moment? Must be a yeah. Well, you know, business stuff. You, re- I remember the rest of my life. Who knows? Right? <laughs> okay, so tell us how do you start your first business? Uh, not first, your official business at Silicon Valley. So, um, I-, I was working for a company. It went out of business, um, and I started doing a little consulting. This is in the software business, and this is. Um, Let's see, this is early 1995. And the consulting project, one of the guys at the company, I was doing a, a, um, a product plan for a gene- genealogy program. Okay. It was called Family Tree. And one of the workers there said, hey, have you, have you seen the internet? And I said, no, I read a little bit about it. And he sat me down at, at the office and he showed me how he could make a change in a document and then... It would show up in a browser. It was mosaic, made mosaic at the time, yeah. and how immediate and automatic it was. And so I started to learn about the the the, the, the how it worked, and it was a distributed network. And I was like, "Wow, this is going to change the world." Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go start consulting as a way to get started and a way to bootstrap something. So you consult while you're learning. 
If, yes, that's the best way to do consulting. The problem was none of the marketing people at the time wanted to hire a consultant to do it. They all wanted to learn on, on the company's dime. Uh-huh. So I ended up starting a company partly out of accident. It was called Mystery Net. And hey. it started, we started a website called thecase.com. Okay. And the idea was you would come, you'd sign up. So what I learned at a conference, I went to an early, I think it might have been the first or second internet conference in Silicon Valley, was that people were getting all these email lists and then they didn't know what to do with them. Or com- people would come to a website and they would never come back. So the whole, co- it was very, very transient at the time, if you will. So I said, so I, I woke up with this idea one day, well, what if I emailed people a mystery like, you know, like the little kid mystery that you solve, but it would be for adults. And you'd have to come to the back for the website for extra clues and then to sol- and then you'd come back again for the solution. Just like magic. Yeah, just like magic. Yeah. We ended up having a magic portion of that site, but that's another story. Of course. <laughs> but it was called thecase.com. <laughs> okay. I hired, um, did a did a whole a whole look for a for a, a writer. I found, and it turns out, I found the guy who was probably the most qualified guy in the country to do it. He had done some some early um, online stuff, so he was open to my phone call, um, and uh, the case took off. We ended up being featured on Good Morning America. Wow! And I learned very quickly that the internet wasn't ready to send tens of thousands of people an email every. Thursday night. Wow, you are very advanced looking at that time. Yeah, so it was. So I ended up having to manually send the emails until we could find a service provider who could do it. <laughs> wow, I mean, yeah, what a process. I didn't know what to expect, but we had by the end um, hundreds of thousands of email subscribers. I don't even remember the numbers anymore. Incredible. But had to wind down in uh, Why? early two thousand one. The the bubble. the bubble and the the capital crunch that happened. Even good ideas. Um, And looking back, my idea was a good idea. Um, The bigger vision was was a really good idea, which was to build these small entertainment networks. But if you weren't like going like that in terms of your user growth, you couldn't raise money. And then once you once the money stopped, you couldn't raise money for anything. Mm. I mean, 2001. Isn't that so interesting? Well, it, it is, and it's it's not that different from the last couple of years. Yeah. Tell us a little bit We're, more about that, Steve. Well, so investor mentality just goes with the flow, right? And either it's feast or famine, and they, they tend to be very extreme, mm-hmm. right? So in that era, it was all about eyeballs. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's, it wasn't. Same as now, isn't it? Well, no, not now. It was all about revenue growth. Correct, right? correct, correct. And, and the problem with revenue growth is that if the underlying metrics mm-hmm. are not sound, the revenue is not sound. Define right? those metrics. Well, that's the key, right? And, and I call it, I, I've got a concept where I call it chain reactions. You've got to look at the catalyst. So, so, so taking a step back, I like to teach entrepreneurs that revenue is not a metric. So what is then? It's a result or an outcome mm-hmm. from the metrics that precede it, right? So if you think about a visit and then an interaction, mm-hmm. maybe a repeat visit, maybe a browse, you go to the shopping cart, right? But it all starts with the visit, right? At least for e-commerce or for most website businesses, right? Even for SaaS business, right? Mm-hmm. It all starts with someone coming to the website. Well, we got to start with, well, how did they get there, right? And I've had many of people tell me, well, it doesn't matter, right? You know, and they look at their aggregate spend, right? Doesn't well, matter. No. We spent ten thousand dollars on ads. Well, when I built the predecessor to offers.com, we looked at the sessions. So we actually looked at what keyword brought them to the website mm-hmm. and then what did they do? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the catalyst. The key the, the ad it goes, you know, ad keyword, what page did they get to on the website, then what action did they take? Right. And it's the combination of those metrics that that are the key metrics that are the most important ones. What's the ratios? Mm -hmm. What's the what's the what's the costs? Right. And the revenue is just the outcome. Mm -hmm. Right. And I really like that perspective because now we can 
not only just say love and love you, but we tell them how. We we almost like shed the light on this black box. It's like oh my god, loving is great. Of course, everyone know that, but okay, how you really shed the light and give them the tangible steps with you yourself walk the walk, but also now share that you know that advice and that experience to entrepreneurs. On that journey, so they can、oh, do the same too. And, and the problem is when we had zero interest rates, right? And revenue and and capital was just flowing madly.、Yeah. Revenue growth was all that mattered, right?、Uh-huh. And and I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I met with that were spending two dollars to get back a dollar. That's not good math. No, but but that's what they were thought that they needed to do. Oh, because at the time interest rates so low, easy to borrow. Well,、that. the 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 assumption was eventually we'll figure out the marketing. And I'd rather figure out the the unit economics earlier no, on.、Yeah. Figure out the the contribution is the most important thing. So taking a step back,、mm-hmm, right?、Mm-hmm. So you, so you've you've got a couple of concepts, right? Which is the fuel, which is what I just described, which is the path somebody goes on. The the, the second one being is the contribution is the most important thing,、mm-hmm, right?、Mm-hmm. Right. And then the third is how do you make it repeatable,、mm. right? So those. So what's the secrets、elements. for those three? That's well, the th- very the, exciting. The, the secrets are building a culture around metrics-based decision making. Okay. Right, and that's the secret, and it starts at the top, right?、Mm. Most of the time with the CEO. Sometimes it has to go back and start with the board of directors,、mm-hmm, right?、Mm-hmm. Depending on the size or the scope of a company, right? Because、mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sometimes a board will say, "Well, we need to grow our revenue n percent." And to do that, the company spends two dollars to make a dollar,、mm-hmm. right? But the reality is,、mm-hmm. if you didn't worry about revenue growth and you said, "Well, how do I figure out how to spend fifty cents to make a dollar?"、Mm-hmm. and then eventually, I just have to repeat what I the what the action I did that that spent the fifty cents,、mm-hmm. and just keep doing more of that.、Mm-hmm. That's a repeatable model.、Right? So, for our listeners who are maybe in a different side of sector, right? Is this only apply to e-commerce, or what do we apply? No, it would, it, apply, it would apply. It would apply to all sectors because it's all about who are my customers. How do I get more of them?、Mm-hmm. Right. That's the simplest way to look at it. I met with a、um, a marketing services firm recently. I,、oh. I did. This is this actually goes back about a year. I did office hours. They showed up.、Uh-huh. They were a two million dollar company. They had about two hundred customers. Okay. But they were stuck. They were flat. Uh, meaning year over year growth. Yeah. Okay. And they wanted to grow. Uh huh. Um. And I said, well, before you start to grow, let's address a couple of questions. Yeah. So I said, well, tell me about your customers. Okay. And they kept describing them in aggregate. Aggregate meaning like this lumped the, together, the, mounted together, right? Uh huh. As if, if as if they had one. It was like a black box. We have two hundred customers. This、uh-huh. is what we do. Uh huh. So I so I shared an exercise I like to do. I I call it more A's less F's. Right? Okay. The concept, general concept, is how do we figure out which of our customers are good ones? Uh huh. Find more of them.、Uh, how do you define good ones? Good, that we make money from them. Correct. But I assume if you have one product, all customer pay. Well, no. If if you actually look at a marketing services firm or even a SaaS firm,、uh-huh. right? Well, and I'll come back to SaaS. Remember、okay. to marketing come back for to service, marketing、yes. service because SaaS has a really good way to do、Different. it as well. Yeah. That most SA- early SaaS companies miss as well, right?、Uh-huh. But in the marketing services time. It was like okay, so how much are they spending per month?、Uh-huh. How much did it cost you to get them?、Mm-hmm. And then how much support are you providing them, right?、Okay. And then rank them A's, B's, C's, D's, E's, F's. Oh, I、right? like that. And then I said, now you have to fire the F's or、uh-huh. or double their price. And just so I understand, A to F is ranking by revenue. It's by the profitability. Profitability. So it's not your revenue. It's margin. It's contribution. It's really not profitability. Contribution. Contribution is the most important metric. Okay. Of all, and it's really a res- it's an outcome of all the other metrics, right? Okay. So just to take a step back, contribution.、Yeah. We take revenue.、Uh-huh. We minus cost of goods or cost of sales. Okay. I prefer the concept cost of sales. Okay. But unfortunately, it's called cost of goods, Good. mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But but it's really cost of sales. Now that includes your customer success people if you're a SaaS company. Oh,、right? I see. I see. Most I see. companies don't put that in. Yeah,、right? yeah, yeah. But that's the cost of delivering the product. Got、right? it. Got it. And then you divide, subtract out、mm-hmm. sales and marketing,、mm-hmm. right? Oh wow! And then you get to contribution. Wow, this is really, really all the cost. And it, well, if contribution is negative,、uh-huh. the likelihood of your ever succeeding in a company is pretty low. Oh, right. Okay. Unless and, it's getting better over time. So, for our audience, so thinking for themselves, 
if you have customer success, maybe it's one person over multiple accounts or you have average. How do you calculate that per person? You see what I'm well, saying? Yeah. So in the marketing services firm, you 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 just have to somewhat wing it sometimes uh-huh, yeah. until you put the right metrics in place. But what it forces you to do this exercise yeah. is start realizing, well, gosh, I don't know which of my customers we make money from. Yeah. Right? Yes. In the SaaS example, uh-huh. it's... Who's who's using my product? Uh huh. Right. Who's who? You know, because guess what? If they're not using your SaaS product, they're not going to renew. Correct. Right. Correct. Correct. Who's getting value out of it? How much value are they getting out? Mm-hmm. If you can't look at that per customer mm-hmm. by by their usage, uh-huh. it's unlikely you really know who your A's are, who your B's are, and then and then you have to go back and say, well, how do I get more good ones? Uh huh. Right? Uh-huh. How do I raise the price of the bad ones or res- or get rid of them? Uh-huh, uh-huh, right. Uh-huh. And this is why I've, I always say revenue growth is not what's important. It's yeah. it's these. It's this contribution margin that's the most important. And then you can go focus on revenue growth. I think that is such a sound advice. I think so many people are overlooking that. And again, this is not quote unquote sexy and fun, but this is really underlying the what really fuel that sustainable growth for any businesses. Yeah. And it's all about fuel, right? How do we yeah. fuel the growth? Yeah. Right. And we fuel the growth by finding the actions uh-huh. that create the outcomes we want. Yeah. Right? But it's gotta start with the actions uh-huh. that we that we that we want to take, whether that's a click, yeah. whether that's I mean I so I was talking to one SaaS company uh-huh. and we went through a similar exercise. They had five salespeople. Okay. Right. So do you think their salespeople were all equal? Definitely not. I imagine one, it's one lead. One was doing 80% of oh. the revenue and the other four, who knows what they were doing. Of right? course. So all of a sudden you get rid of those four, you find two more like the one uh-huh. and guess You're what? Golden. Now you have positive contribution. Yeah. Because right? remember, your sales costs go in above your contribution, right? So it works just the same whether it's paid uh-huh. search or whether it's salespeople. If you're spending oh, $2 wow. yeah, to make yeah. a dollar, yeah. you're going to have a really hard time getting to profitability. So it's not just about, yeah. So basically, that contribution piece, you you deduct any, everything, anything. Well, all the, the marketing, very, the people, the any. Yeah, expensive. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, executives. It's not rent. Okay. You know, it's not the product development costs, okay. right? Cost of goods, cost of sales, marketing. Sales and marketing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Easy. Yeah. All right. And then you get to the contribution, and and that's the key uh-huh. in my eyes. That's incredibly simple and really powerful. I can imagine that. It it is when you discover it. <laughs> so, so we we had an instance at offers dot com. Uh huh. Do you always um, knew this, Steve? No, I didn't. But I I innately did. But I didn't know how to make it part of the culture. Mm-hmm. Right, Tell which me is that. the most Tell important that, thing. Yeah. So, um, the we we had about twenty websites uh-huh. as a company. I started in, um, geez, I can't even remember what year I started. Um, uh, Two thousand two. I started. Two, yeah, we built up some websites. We had about twenty. Uh-huh. Bought the domain name offers dot com in about two thousand eight. Uh-huh. Started building it, and then the financial collapse happened. Mm-hmm. So we were in, originally planning one path, and we pivoted. Before we even launched it into being coming more of a coupon and deal website, mm-hmm. which is what it was when I when I sold it um, a couple of years ago, oh, well, more than a couple. Uh, yeah, thank you. But um, but before we launched Offers dot com um, during the recession, the Great Recession, as they like to call it, I always hate the Great Recession. No, there was nothing great about it. I promise you. For any listeners who are around, then there was nothing great about it. It doesn't. It was the worst. Business environment for a for a tech company. Mm-hmm. Um, we promoted um, book clubs and credit cards, both of which were credit par- products. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we lost about seventy percent of our of our revenue. Wow! Over a, a course of about six months, it, it was just like this. So we started building offers dot com to to have it turn the other way. We got how did you able to pivot so quickly? I mean, six months losing seventy percent of revenue that's not an easy pill to swallow. Well, right? we already had some growth ideas. We had already started on offers dot com. We just had to pivot it again while we were pivoting. Right, nothing like doing a, a two-part pivot. But anyway, wow. we started a, a tax site. Uh, uh, first, we started a travel site, and that was doing well. And then we started a tax site, and this was right before we launched Offers.com. And um, one day, um, one of our marketing managers lost $50,000. It's as if they lit it on fire. 
Uh, what do you mean? It was over two days. Well, so we had a meeting. We had this new site. It was a new category for us. And, I, you know, and, I, and we were going to go build a new campaign. It seemed pretty th- clear. We had done it many times. Yeah. But this particular marketing person had never done this, right? But he had managed existing campaigns. We thought, well, he knew what it looked like. It's happening, he what, yeah. He knew what it, what, it, what it was supposed to look like at the end to optimize it. Well, to make a long story short, um, two days after we launched the campaign, we had gone through fifty grand. That's a lot of money back then. It was a lot Still of money are today, and and it, it was the difference between being profitable and not being profitable that month. Of Fortunately, we made it up that quarter because we were profitable for thirteen quarters in a row, uh, thirteen years in a row. But anyway, so we had a meeting, and um, he he basically said, "Well, I did what I was told." He said, "Well, I didn't tell you to light fifty thousand dollars in fire. I told you to do an experiment." Well, so at that moment, I realized, well, we hadn't defined what an experiment was. He thought it was all about, I spend a dollar, I get a visitor to the website, hopefully they buy something. And he missed all of the metrics in between. Which keyword was it? Which ad? All the refining you do early in a campaign, you don't start spending the money until you have positive contribution, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And he missed that concept. So it was my fault, right, for not instilling that in the company, right? Because we hadn't done a new campaign for a while because we were waiting for Offers.com to launch. But it was a great lesson. And the lesson was you really have to teach what are the the predecessor metrics. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't just go visitor, customer, right? Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of things along the way. And again, this is true not just in e-commerce. This is true in all facets. Every sector, yeah. Yeah. Now you explain it. I was like, yes, that applies for everybody. Yeah, so that was a great turning point for the company. And then I think it's so admirable that I imagine it's a challenging event at the time. Are you able to see it such a positive eyes to say, wow, this is actually a, a blessing and learning and how was it pivot in a yeah. more positive momentum? I, I, I mean, I'll never forget the day we met and I was just like, what happened? It was, <laughs> you know, it was a cloudy day. We were yeah. in a conference room. Yeah. There were five of us. You um, remember the scene and, like yesterday. And it was like, okay, so I did a lot of discussing with the management team Mm -hmm. like okay how do we how do we address this Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's when we came up with the that we really had to do a better job of Mm -hmm. of showing what the what key metrics were not just click outcome which is revenue because we were really focused on revenue growth at the time nothing wrong with that and that's why it's your heart lesson you learning today and that's why you tell other fellow entrepreneurs it's not just about revenue yes Yes. And I'm curious, Steve, you know, sounds like at that point, even that moment, you had a lot of up, a lot of down through your own venture, journey, startup, and now your own thing, and now experiment different experience. Like, I'm curious, through the up and downs, what will hold you forward? What what what, what, what drove you say, you know what, I'm going to keep going? What is that thing that... Yeah, that's a that? good question. I've never really thought about it like that. I mean, I think some of it is you have no choice, right? You, we always a- have a choice, Steve. Especially once you get to a... Si- I mean, we were like 20 people when this was going on, that's decent right? decent size. Um, I had a list of, you know, what we could do if we had to, um, but uh, we powered through it. I believed that we... With offers.com was a good name. We had a good business model of doing um, SEO and paid search. We had a good technology platform. I really believe we could just make it work. All we had to do was was basically get through those first, you know, kind of six months of the of of the launch. And when we launched it in in February of I think it was '09, mm-hmm. um, it it was a nice slow steady. Um, exactly the way you want it to be, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It didn't shoot to the moon, in which case we wouldn't have known why, right? It was very slow and steady, so we were able to keep refining it and iterating it. And um, and from that year forward, we grew almost 40% every year until we wow. started the company. And was it hard to walk away from the baby you built? Yeah, in many ways, it was hard, but it was time. It was, you know, four pivots, 13 years, you know, we were about 60 yeah. people when we sold it. Oh, wow. And this is just more like a, a, a beautiful experience for help fellow entrepreneurs also think, when is time to walk away, when is not? How do you know it's time to exit? You know, I, I think when you know, when you later find out you exited a little early, right, uh-huh. that is probably a, was probably a good time, 
right? Because you can't time it perfectly, yeah. right? Um, for me, it was a combination of, you know, the, 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 my kids were at an age where I wanted to spend more time with them. Um, the company was at a place where everything was running smoothly. So that's a good time to sell, mm-hmm. right? Because it's really easy to, to show this is the business we've got, right? We had multiple parties that were interested in, in the business, um, so it all just kind of lined up, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, the business continued to, to to do very well after that. And my understanding is it's still doing well today. That's amazing! Um, wow, what is what a, what a story! And I'm curious as you looking back, what is the one biggest lesson you learned along the way? See, well, being an entrepreneur at the portion of your life. I, I don't know if it's persistence is a lesson or if that's just an attribute, right? Okay. Um, it's, it's hard to, to pinpoint one. I mean, from a business standpoint, mm-hmm. I'm very metrics driven. Mm-hmm. Um, probably, I'd argue, in perhaps too metrics driven, right? But when you bootstrap a company, which is what we were, mm. you, you, you don't have a choice, right? I mean, the most important thing is that we're in business tomorrow, Right. Yeah. Because if you if you don't stay in business, you don't get you don't get the chance to ever yeah really v- fulfill your vision or your dream. Right. So I think to a certain point, it's great to have lofty visions, and and, mm-hmm. and we had some along the way. Some mm-hmm, were, mm-hmm. some worked, some didn't. Yeah. But I I really think some people sometimes miss that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. And 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 some of that is. If you raise too much money, you, you can't just survive. You, 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 at least people don't think you can. Right? Uh, say one time, you raise too much money, you can survive? No, if you raise too much money, you've got to focus on building something grand, uh-huh. right? And so you don't think it's a good idea to raise too much money? No, I mean, unless your idea is big enough, yeah. right? Unless you're capable of it's it, right? Explain that to founder, yeah. because often I found founder probably feel like, well, the more money I have, the better it is. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the best amount of money to raise is the amount of money you need. mm Right and now, how do people find out how much they need? Well, you really have to have a plan, right? Um, 